if you're a note taker. And uh, Jeff is out of town this week, and uh, he asked me to, if we could combine the youth class with the adult Sunday school class, which we're always happy to do. Um, you might notice if you did take note sheets that we are not in the book of Nehemiah this morning, which is what book you are set to be in as your adult class. The youth are also doing the Old Testament survey, but we are nine books behind you guys, and uh, I don't think we're going to catch you. But uh, one, of, one of the things I asked Jeff, I said, you know, what's your opinion on me doing judges, because as a class you've already covered that, and uh, he thought it would be encouraging to have another angle on the book, and so he encouraged me to do that, and so I want to follow his leadership in that, and uh, I told him, I said, you know what this means, right? That means that you've given everybody the answer sheet, and now I'm submitting my exam for scoring, so we'll, we'll see how I do. You don't have to tell me what my score is, just tell me if I pass. That's, that's the goal. So with that, let me go ahead and pray for us this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to Judges chapter 2, which is where we're going to land here in just a minute. And as you turn there, or maybe when you're done turning there, let's go ahead and pray this morning. Ask the Lord to teach us from his word this morning. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do come this morning to learn. We pray that as we open up the scriptures that you would uh, teach us from your word. Father, we also come to um, be exhorted. Many many in this room this morning um, need spiritual encouragement, so I pray that that would take place as well. Uh, But above all these things, Father, we come as your people to worship this morning, and so I pray that we would have that mindset as we read and as we consider these historical events, why you've included them in our Bible for us to to see and to consider this morning. And Father, as your people, we do thank you for Christ. We thank you for his death and his resurrection. Father, we praise you for his ascension. We praise you for his sovereignty, that he continues to build the church that he bought with his blood. And so as your church, Father, we gather to look at the glories of Christ and to worship your name and and to worship your spirit this morning. And so, Father, as we look at this book this morning, the book of Judges, I pray that we would learn about your character and, Father, how you would want us to respond to what we see this morning. Give us insight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you're not there already, you can turn to Judges chapter 2. One of the things that I've realized as I continue to grow uh, by the Lord's grace in my walk with Christ, as I get older, I realize that there are certain parts of the Bible that are getting harder to read. I think for young believers, for those who are just starting out studying their Bible, it's easy for us to approach the scriptures from an intellectual standpoint, or maybe even worse, we don't see the Bible as a mirror that tells us about our own condition. It's easy for us to say those Israelites or those disciples or whatever the case may be. But when we look at what's happening here in this particular section of the Old Testament, the book of Judges is, is a hard read. It is bloody, it is dark, there are acts of blasphemy all throughout these pages. And as I grow in my relationship with Christ, and as I read my Bible, the reality sets in more that this is historical, that these are actual people that did these things. And even more than that, Those of us who are in Christ, even though we've been set free from our sin, we still have the tendency to be drawn towards rebellion. That apart from the grace of Christ, this is exactly the condition we are in without the grace and mercies of Christ. So my challenge to you this morning is when we look at this book, as we look at the survey of judges, don't look at it at a distance. Try to 
fight through just the simple intellectual understanding of the book, but I want you to see it as, as a mirror for your own tendencies in your own flesh and in your own weaknesses. And maybe this morning there are some of you that need to consider salvation. Maybe you have not come to Christ. Maybe this will expose a, a cycle and a tendency in your own behavior. And so against this, this black backdrop of sinfulness, we get to see the beauties of Jesus. And so maybe when we're done this morning, we walk out of our, our class that we will will take sin more seriously than we do when we walked in this morning. But at a high level, let's kind of get our, our bearings on the book. And so you'll notice at the first part of your, your note sheet, where we have the stats for our book. This is book number seven in our Old Testament, 27 chapters long, 618 verses, and roughly 15,000 words in the original Hebrew. This book does not claim authorship in the text itself, but most Jewish traditions tell us that Samuel was the author of this book, and he certainly does seem the most likely candidate when we look at biblical history. This book was written around 1043 B.C., and it actually covers an astonishing 350 years of, of biblical history. So we're looking at the nation of Israel from the conquest of what happened under the leadership of Joshua to the time of Eli and Samuel. Now, Eli and Samuel are the the last two judges that their story is more unfolded in the book of 1 Samuel. But the reason this time period is, is so disturbing is because we see the state of the nation of Israel and for how long they are in this state. And as you'll see, the book starts in a very depressing view of the condition of the people, and it ends in the same state, that they are, they are in a bad spiritual condition as God's people. One of the scholars that I was looking at when looking at the, the overview of this book, he describes the, the book of Judges as the dark ages of the Old Testament. And that's a pretty fitting title. When we hear the dark ages in terms of, of uh, human history, we think about the, that period of time from the, the fall of the Roman Empire to the time of the Renaissance. So that time period in between there we call the dark ages. And people usually will call it that because there is a lack of cultural and scientific advancement. And so they're talking more about uh, civic matters, uh, creativity, uh, intellectual advancement. But Judges is not talking about culture. It's actually exposing the dark period of the human condition of what happens when you let sin take over your life, when you pursue things that are against God's law. So I want to give you the main divisions of the book to start with, and we can kind of see how the book is, is structured. Then we're going to spend our time looking at a key passage, and then we're going to go into the, the understanding of how this book actually points us to Christ. So chapters 1 and 2, as it starts the book, it describes Israel's disobedience to God's law, which then ushers them into a time of slavery. There are opposing nations that actually come in and then um, take over the people and enslave them. So that's chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 3 through 16, which is really the heart of the book, is where God, by his mercy, provided deliverance for his people through his appointed judges. Now, normally when we hear the term judge in our culture, we'll think of law courts, But the term in Hebrew can literally be translated as deliverer or savior. So they would come in by God's direction, and they would be raised up to set their people free from enslavement. And so many of them, you can think of them more as military commanders rather than just people who were dealing with the law. Now, they did uphold God's law. That was part of their their function was to was to to bring the the truth of God's law before the people, but their job was to set them free from their slavery. And then the book ends, chapter 17 through 21, 
by describing the depravity of Israel. Despite the Lord's kindness to continually set them free, uh, the book ends in that dark description as well. So to kind of get at the heart of the book, I want to take us now to the, to the key passage, and that's why we're in, in Judges chapter 2. If you've done any study of the book of Judges, it's, you'll pretty easily come upon what's called the cycle of sin. Has anybody ever heard of that from the book of Judges before? A few people have. And so before we look at this cycle in specifics, I want to read for you two verses that are woven into the, the latter part of the book. It's in chapter 17 and then again in chapters 21. I want to read you two verses from this section of the book, and you'll notice that both of these verses are taken from the third book division, which talks about the depravity of Israel. So in chapter 17, verse 6, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. And then the last verse of the book, this is how the book closes. Chapter 21, verse 25. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so if you look at your note sheet, you'll see a kind of a visual description of this cycle. It starts with sin at the very top. The defining sin of the nation at that particular point was idolatry. So they would choose to worship other gods, and then that would lead them to slavery. And then once they'd been taken captive, the people then would cry out, that is their supplication, and God in his mercy would then raise up a judge who would deliver them, but they would then go back into this cycle. And as you go through the book of Judges, they do this cycle seven different times. Now there's, there's 13 judges in total, which tells us a couple of things. One is that the people continue to sin in this way, but also that a judge, uh, there were judges that overlapped each other because we have seven cycles but 13 judges. So there were particular judges that were in certain parts of the land even though they didn't have uh, military command over the entirety of, of the land. And so this cycle, as it continues to go through, it kind of starts to show for us, God is, is telling us, there's something for us to learn here in our own propensity to go towards sin and rebellion. It makes me think of, of Paul's words in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He's, he's talking more about the, the time when, when the nation of Israel was committing sin while the law was being given in the book of Exodus. But the, the principle applies here too. Paul says, these things are written for our instruction that we may learn about our own condition. And so let's go ahead and read our key passage. I want you to be thinking about that cycle as as we read through this this morning. Chapter 2, we're going to read verses 10 through 19. Be thinking of those four pieces as we read. Verse 10. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work of which he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. So they forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Ashtaroth. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel, and he gave them into the hands of plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies around them so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had spoken, and as the Lord had sworn to them, so that they were severely distressed. Then the Lord raised up judges and delivered them from the hands of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they played the harlot after other gods and bowed themselves down to them. 
they turned aside quickly from the way in which their fathers had walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord. They did not do as their fathers. When the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who had oppressed and afflicted them. But it came about when the judge died that they would turn back and act more corruptly than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and bow down to them. They did not abandon their practices or their stubborn ways. So again, using Paul's terminology, these things are written as warnings for us. So I want us to kind of pick out a few things here from this section. What are some reasons that they were sent into captivity? What are some of the specific things that this text tells us that was the issue with Israel? Yes. So idolatry. They were bowing down to to other gods besides the one true God. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah. They abandoned the Lord. Interesting terminology, right? They didn't listen to the, the ones that God had sent them by his mercy. They didn't listen. That's key. Yes. Yeah. So as long as the immediate voice was in front of them, the human voice, but then once that was removed, then the heart the heart was not changed is the implication, right? Yeah, Aaron. Yeah. Exactly. So they weren't passing the truth on to the next generation. That's very key. Yes. Mhm. Yeah. They were turning aside from what had been handed down to them. So that kind of compounds the issue. We have people receiving things from their father but not listening to it and then not teaching their children the truth. And so as, as the generations are, are going, this is th- over 300 years of, of the cycle happening. Yeah. Anything else from that section that stands out to you? Right. Yeah, it was so blatant. It was blatant rejection. There's a lot of people that on the surface will look the part, you know, even in our culture today, right? They'll call themselves Christians. They'll, they'll go to church. They'll do these things. But what's going on in the heart? And, and Mark's point is at some point to be so obvious in your idolatry is, uh, shows the descent that the people had gone to. Yes. Yeah, so it gets worse in the next generation. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Good. Well, a couple of these have been mentioned, but let me kind of show you a couple of the the highlights here as we go through this section. Verse 10 says that they did not know the Lord, nor yet the work he had done, so that's a lack of understanding of who God is. It's important for us to reflect on what God has done for us. Verse 11 specifically says they did evil. And it says the the defining sin is idolatry. Now remember, I I was challenging you not to read this book at a distance. 
when we hear the sin of idolatry, we, we typically think Old Testament, ancient cultures, tiny statues, but that's not the case. I want you to kind of keep a finger here in, in Judges and turn over to 1 John chapter 5. First John 5. So we're jumping into New Testament, the church, New Covenant. John, who had been in the presence of Christ, commissioned as an apostle, he's writing this epistle. He's challenging the church with worldliness to, to separate themselves from, from being like the world. He's giving very practical exhortations to what it means to, to be a follower of Christ. And, uh, and then he ends his book. This is how he summarizes his message to us. Look at verse 20. It says, And we know the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ, This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourself from idols. John ends his epistle with the warning that idolatry is still the defining sin of all of us. When you choose to sin, you are discarding God's law And you're putting yourself as a higher law. Or maybe you're following the influence of somebody else. That is worshiping someone or something other than the one true God. The the idolatry is at the root of every sin that we commit. So let's go back to Judges. This is a mirror for us. We're we're seeing our, our condition apart from Christ. Chapter 2, verse 11 says that the people did evil. They, they committed idolatry. We do the same thing today. Verse 15 is, is challenging. Look what verse 15 says. It says, wherever they went, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. We affirm God's sovereignty. But do we realize the implications of what God's sovereignty and and how far-reaching that is? Everything that happens is because of God's providential guidance. There's nothing in God that can do evil because there is nothing in him that is... uh, He cannot be tempted, we learn in the book of James. But God can use sin sinlessly and he did so for his people he brought evil to his people because of their idolatry so that's a that's a serious warning for us we're we're talking about the idea of consequences that god brings consequences when we go against his his word look at verse 16 what amazing grace and for all this description of the people Verse 16 then says, The Lord raised up judges who delivered them. These people do not deserve deliverance. We don't deserve deliverance in Christ either. We tend to think that, that uh, in the back of our minds there was a reason that God saved us in Christ. But there's not. It's, it's because of his mercy and his character. This was already mentioned, verse 17. It says, They did not listen to their judges. They didn't listen to the ones that were bringing God's law and telling the people to to turn from their their ways. Verse 18, it specifically tells us that the Lord was moved by pity because of the groaning of the people. And so they they would get into these circumstances and they would cry out and then God would have pity on them because he's a good God. So this, this uh, is, is one way for us to, to do some self-examination. It was kind of mentioned a couple of different ways from, from some of the feedback that some of you gave. When you sin, 
How do you respond? What is your response to sin? And maybe even more pointed than that, when the consequences are removed, do you tend to want to go back to that sin? So is it the consequences that are the issue for you? Or do you get to the point where you have a spiritual perspective that the reason that you hate sin is because it offends the God that you love. It's so easy for us to get caught up in just the consequence piece. And that's what we see with the people. Once they were delivered and everything kind of calms down again, the heart wasn't changed and they go back to those those same habits. They would turn back to them. So God in his mercy, there are times where he lifts the consequences because of your sin. He hears your cry. He's he's moved by pity for you. But when those consequences are lifted, when when life is, 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 um, is, is not in the fire anymore, What's what's your heart tend to do? Are you still being drawn back to that sin that you originally committed? It's like that the picture of of the crying criminal after he's been caught. Like I don't exactly know why he's crying. Is he crying because he was caught, or because he's truly sorry for what he's done? It's difficult for us to tell, even in our own hearts. So the, one of the reasons that this book is hard to read is because we struggle with sin every single day, even being set free from Christ. But God is, is kind of exposing a, a pattern here. He's showing the, the cycle of sin. We, we talked about this last Sunday when we were in the book of Joshua. When Achan was confronted with his corruption, he, he refused to confess. God was narrowing down by tribe, by household by family to get to the exposure of the person that had committed this sin which caused them to be defeated in their their battle at Ai but but Achan never confesses until God shines the spotlight on him and then he says yes I saw I coveted I took and then I hid and those four patterns are all the way throughout Scripture. I want you to turn to James chapter 1. God is showing us here the, the cycle of sin even in the life of a believer in the church today. James chapter 1. Look at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, he gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished... <clears throat> it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. The pattern in Joshua chapter 7 with Achan, pattern in the book of Judges. James <clears throat> shows us this pattern as well. There is lust, a desire. The battle starts on the inside. If you're, if you're only battling your sins outwardly, you're so far down the process, you've probably already lost the battle. It starts with a desire, an impulse on the inside. And the, the imagery that James uses here is very graphic. It's almost the picture of being impregnated. That's the language in, in the Greek here. When lust is conceived, you're going to have this child, and it's going to bring about sin and death. 
So it's, it's not an outward battle. It has to be something that is changed on the inside. God has to, to give you new desires. You have to have a new way of thinking. You have to have a new conscience, a new heart. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Jason very helpfully gave us a visual saying that the, the heart is the steering wheel of the life. Your passions, your desires, the things that you're drawn to are, are going to be what drives how you live. And everything issues from the heart. And so for the, the beauty of salvation in Christ, what we don't see in the nation of Israel is that it was all external. There were consequences, and so they cried out because they were enslaved. There was a judge right in their presence, and so they were they were obedient while the judge lived, but remove the voice, remove the consequences, the external things are removed. That's why we see so many people when they, when they experience a little bit of freedom from, quote unquote, the church, that they go and they live the way that they want to live because it was only external. We need to be changed on the inside and only Christ can do that. Only the new birth can bring that to us. And so as we look at the last section of our, our notes here, it's essential when we go to study the Bible, it's essential for us to ask the question, okay, so how does this particular book point us to Christ? Because I, I've, I've spent the first 35 minutes painting a pretty dark picture of our condition. And there's a reason for that. But this book actually is pointing us to something that is so beautiful and, and so freeing because it's showing us our need for a true Savior. Remember, the, the title of judge in the Hebrew can be translated as Savior, as one who redeems the people. This is an imagery of the greater Redeemer that we need in the person of Christ. So how does this book point us to Jesus? I need to kind of show you a, a theme that's that's woven throughout the Bible in general, and then you'll see it on display here in the book of Judges as well. All throughout the Bible, since God created man, God appointed man to be his representatives on the earth. We are supposed to be God's spokespeople. We are supposed to um, reflect his honor and reflect his glory. So he's given us responsibilities. He's given us work to do, and we're supposed to do that work in a way that shows how great God is. But the problem is, is that we have corrupted ourselves by breaking his law. And so we fail to represent him the way that we have been called to represent him. Let me give you a couple of examples. In Genesis chapter 1, God created Adam. Adam was supposed to be God's representative on the earth, the one that is supposed to live according to God's revealed law, and Adam failed to do that. He fell short because of his rebellion. So we see the language, for example, in Romans chapter 5, that Christ, he came to fulfill what Adam could not do. Christ is what we call the second Adam. He is the perfect representative where Adam failed. In Romans chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Adam was supposed to show Christ, and he failed to do that. And so what he did not accomplish, Jesus accomplished, and now we are in Christ in salvation rather than in Adam, which is the, the beauty of salvation. The Lord also established a priesthood. He wanted his people to be led in worship, but every single priest failed to live lives that were holy. And so in Hebrews chapter 4, we see the description that Christ came to be the great high priest. Because all those who had appointed to do that work failed to do the work. God established a monarchy because he wanted there to be representatives of kings on the throne 
that showed God's law and his beauty. And every single king failed. And so, we see the book of Matthew in particular that shows that Christ is king. He came to do what all the earthly kings failed to do. And then we come to the book of Revelation, which says that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is doing what we have failed to do. God also wanted there to be shepherds. He wanted there to be spiritual leaders for his people, even, even in the nation of Israel. But all of those leaders, those spiritual leaders in the nation, they failed to lead the people. So Jesus, in John chapter 10, tells us, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep. Sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus is the fulfillment of that perfect shepherd for his people. Now, with that in mind, go back to Judges chapter 11, and we see the first hint that there is a greater one to come. Judges chapter 11. And look at verse 27. I therefore have not sinned against you, but you are doing me wrong by making war against me. May the Lord, the judge... Judge today between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ammon. So we see a title here for God. This is a significant title. In the book of Judges, a list of of 13 different human judges, and then God himself is called the judge. He is the perfect judge. And that's what Christ is proven to be for us. He's been given by the Father to judge the creation. Not just Israel, but but Christ is going to judge all people. I want to show you a couple of different passages that talk about the Lord Jesus as a judge. The first one is in John chapter 5. Look at verse 22. Actually, to pick up the context, let's go ahead and read verse 19. This is, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these, so that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So this now expands the idea of of God being a judge, not only for his chosen nation, but now through the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is going to judge all people. We see this again in Acts chapter 17. Go ahead and turn there. Paul, in his speech at Mars Hill is trying to explain to people why they should respond to the gospel and come to salvation. He gives them a 
an eternal perspective here. Acts chapter 17. And look in verse 29. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. Therefore... Having overlooked the time of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead." God is declaring that if you have not repented of your sins, you need to repent. You need to listen to God's law. You need to listen to His warning because He has fixed a day in the future where you will be judged. And it's interesting, the language that Paul uses here is that he has given you proof that this day is coming. And the proof that God gave is by raising Jesus from the dead. The day is fixed. It's non-negotiable. It's not going to be changed. It's going to happen. And every day that you live, you're moving closer to that day of judgment. And Paul is saying, because that is true, you need to repent. You need to come to Christ because he is the judge of all people. Paul reiterates his truth in 2 Timothy 4. You don't have to turn there. Verses 1 through 2, he says this. This is the end of Paul's life. He's, he's about to be uh, martyred for his faith, and he knows that his time is, is near. So he's giving this charge to Timothy. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. He says, Timothy, I want you to see how serious this charge is for you to preach the word that he calls two witnesses to his charge. And his witnesses are God the Father and Jesus Christ. And he calls Christ the judge. He is going to judge all people. But I think it's also important to remember that even as believers, we will also be judged. There's a day of judgment for us as well. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. As I'd mentioned before, the the beauty of the gospel is that we have in Christ, if you've put your faith in Christ and in Christ alone, if you have confessed him as Lord, if you are a new creation, you have new affections, new desires, and you've been adopted into his family and sealed by his Holy Spirit, then you will, you will never face judgment for your sins because they are they're removed. They're not just covered like the Old Testament sacrifices. They're actually removed in Christ. You are seen as the righteousness of Christ. You are You are a son and a daughter of the king. And that can never change. Romans chapter 8 says, For those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. So that is settled. That that will never change, and that's why we rejoice as God's people. But there is a day of judgment for us. Look at chapter 5, verse 9. It says, therefore, we also have our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest to God, and I hope that we are made manifest also in our consciences. The judgment seat of Christ is not about your salvation, because if you're in the Lord Jesus, that that is already settled, and you are secure. But God will judge you 
according to the work that you've done. You are now a representative. You are now called an ambassador for Christ to do the work that God has called you to do. So how do you use your time? How do you use your, your opportunities with, with those that need to hear the gospel? Um, God has gifted you by the Holy Spirit to be involved in ministry. How are you using those gifts for his good purposes? Because you will stand before the judgment seat and he's going to examine how you've lived your life as his representative. In 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 3, also talks about the fact that there will be some who are saved, yet as though through fire, you barely make it into the kingdom, and all of your works are burned up because they are wood, hay, and stubble. There is a day of judgment for the believers, and we, we desire, it says here in our passage in 2 Corinthians, we desire to be pleasing to Him. We want Him to, it's, it's an act of of it's, it's some, some ways it's a tangible act of, of worship to, to serve Christ with what he's given us. And so is, is Christ pleased with how you live and how you serve? Are you walking in holiness? Is there a desire for the scriptures? Are you doing the work he's called you to do? Because when you, when, as a believer, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to stand alone. He's going to examine you. We see the, the description of Jesus in the book of Revelation as having eyes of flames of fire. He can, he's, he, this, this searing, piercing, fully omniscient view of everything that you've done as a believer is, will he be pleased with what you've done? And the desire is to stand before Christ on the seat of, uh, before the, his judgment seat, and you want him to say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. So a couple things to, to remember from our, our looking at uh, the book of Judges today is that God in his mercy is showing a, a pattern that apart from Christ, this is the cycle that you're in as a fallen, sinful person. And only the Lord Jesus Christ can pull you out of that pattern. So listen to the gospel today. If you have not repented, come to Christ by by faith and by faith alone. Because he has pity. He has mercy on those who cry out for forgiveness. He loves to save sinners. But as believers, know that you you will stand before Christ someday as the judge. And there is a joy in serving the king. There is a joy in saying, Lord, here am I in my, my weak and feeble and inconsistent way. Lord, use me as you see fit because I know that you will examine me someday and I want to be shown to be faithful. And by the way, it's not by your own human effort even as a believer. It's by the, the power of his Holy Spirit that he's given to you to accomplish his work because John 15 tells us that without Christ, we can accomplish Nothing. So think of the joy of that, that God saves you, he puts you in his family, he, he, he fills you with his Holy Spirit, he enables you to do the work, he allows you to be a part of the work that he's doing, which is an incredible blessing. And he says, just be obedient by the power of my spirit, and I will bless you for the work that you couldn't accomplish on your own. And so we'll stand before him because he is a good and righteous judge, and we want people to see that. And so that's why we preach the glories of Christ. So let's close in prayer this morning. Ask the Lord to uh, teach us to listen to the word. Help us to, to turn away from idolatry. To look to Christ for all of our needs. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for the way that the scripture perfectly shows us our condition. And Father, if there are any here that need to be set free from that cycle of sin uh, for the first time, we pray that they would look to the mercies of Christ. They would be willing to let go of the sin that they think they want and to find life in, in your Son. And Father, for your, your church, we thank you that you are faithful to continue to grow us and to sanctify us. Father, help us to be those who are quick to listen to the Scriptures. 
when you give us warnings, when the, those, those times of, of temptations come, I pray that uh, by the strength of your spirit, we would turn away from that. And Father, continue to change our desires so that the, the way that our life is steered is towards holiness because we want to be like we want to be like your son. And Father, help us to be ready uh, to be standing before your judgment seat because we want you to be pleased with our offerings. And so whatever time you give us here, help us to be faithful to those tasks, uh, being led by your spirit. And we pray these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, a couple minutes before the main service, so go grab... Coffee, if you have any other comments or thoughts on the book of Judges, I would love to, uh, to hear those as well. So come and share them. Good morning.